Hello and welcome to lesson number seven. This lesson is all about functions, defining them and using them. So, so far we've actually used quite a few functions. Probably the most commonly remembered and easiest to remember is the print function. We provide a word, the keyword in this case, and then an open brackets, and then the input, which we call arguments. So print one, two, three, one, two, and three are the inputs or the arguments to the function. And then when we execute it on the line, we get an output, some kind of response. Now functions, when you define them, look like this. We say def, which is the function defining keyword. Then we provide some kind of name, my, or even let's call it function, then open brackets, and then the list of inputs that we can have. So in this case, we can have, let's say, p1 and p2. And then we have a colon and we indent, much like we've done with if and for so far. So here we have a function and it takes two inputs, two parameters. I should say before I refer to these as arguments here. When you are using a function, the values you give the function are known as arguments. When you are defining the function, the values are assigned to what we call parameters, which is the reason for P1 and P2. So let's add some code. The function is going to add P1 and P2 together. And then it is going to return that result. There we go. So now if I call function on one, two, it will return three. Very simple. Okay, so that's how we build a function. It's very simple indeed. You don't always have to have a return statement. As you may notice, print does not. So if we were to print one, two, three, and then assign the result from that to a variable, we'll find that nothing is assigned because print doesn't return anything. Our function, however, does. So if we were to say x is equal to function one, two, x will be assigned the value that is returned from the function, which in this case is three. Okay, so let's make a different function. Let's make function three or function two. This time we're gonna take three arguments and we're gonna add those together. But we don't actually need to add p1 and p2 together because we've already defined function earlier we can just use that. So we can say function p1 p2 plus p3 return result. What we've done is use the fact that we already defined a function that would add two arguments together and then we call it in another function and we can build up functional uh, properties like so. We can buy combining functions between functions. And at this point, we can now call function two with one, two, three, and we predictably get back six. However, suppose we wanted function two to take over from function one. Suppose we wanted it to be used instead of. In order to avoid breaking backwards compatibility, one thing we need to do is make sure that function two would work with the same arguments that function one provides. So in this case, function two, one, two, would have to return three. However, at the moment, we just get a type error. How do we deal with this? Well, what we can do is assign P3 a default value. We can say, okay, we're gonna assume that P3 is gonna be zero. If no arguments are provided, then P3 will be assigned zero. This is a default value, and this is known as a keyword argument. So now when we run the code and define the function, if we call function two as we did before with one and two, we get three, just like we did with the regular function one. But if we provide three here, we'll still get six. So this code now works. We have a default value for P3 which is pretty useful. And this is what's known as a keyword argument. We've actually seen a few of these already. 
most notably perhaps in load text. So if I was to import numpy as np, text has file name of some description, so simulation01.txt, and then we would, if it were an experimental CSV file, we'd say delimiter is equal to a comma. That's one keyword argument. Or we could say that uh, skip rows is equal to 52, which is another keyword argument. Now, how would you know these things? How would you find this out? Well, one of them is to look at the documentation, which is to say, look it all up online. And by all means, that method works and it can be very efficient. However, usually a much better way of interrogating this information is through the help function, which is a built-in function to Python. All you need to do is run help on the name of the function and it will give you the doc string, the documentation for it. Now, what is a doc string? A doc string is documentation that is associated with a specific function or class or otherwise thing that is defined within Python. So in this case, load text has this doc string. We have a file name, which is the required object. And then we have a series of keyword arguments, all of which uh, are optional and do not have to be included. We have this full list of parameters as well as descriptions of what they are and how you can create them. It's a very comprehensive list and it's quite long. This is what is used in the documentation online. If we were to look this up online, so if I bring back the uh, window and we were to go to numpy load text and now go to the load text page, you'll see that this matches exactly what we've just been looking at almost word for word. The doc string is almost exactly also included in the online documentation. In fact, you can see it. So if we scroll down further, we'll get to the example section like I just showed you. Now this is a very powerful tool because it means that we can write our own documentation for a function as we go. In our previous case, we've got function two. What we can say is we'll add some documentation just like we did for, just like numpy.loadText has. But how do you add documentation? Is it enough to put in some comments and some text? And the answer is unfortunately no. However, it is still very straightforward. You, do, you need to introduce a new type of string that we haven't seen yet, the triple quote string. The triple quote string in Python is a way of including a block multi-line string. So what you can do is like so, you can uh, create this block of multi-line string and we provide some kind of description at the top. Returns sum of three of two or three parameters provided. There we go. That's our short description of the function. Then we can provide a little bit more detail. The third parameter defaults to zero. Then we can have a list of parameters. And then these would be P1, P2, P3. And then we could have a list of examples as well. Like so, and then we could have the function two, one, two, three and say that returns six, just as we've shown already. And then we can have a function two, one, two, that will return three. And thus we can build up this doc string. And this contains all the information you need to know how to run this code effectively. So now if we had take function two and we were to call help on it, like we did with load text, 
you won't be too surprised to see that the doc string we just wrote is returned. This is incredibly useful. If you're going to be writing your own code or code that is meant to be read by other people, you can document your code as you go and provide much needed help to people who are trying to use it, as it is not always going to be sufficiently obvious what you're doing. Okay, so with that in mind, let's jump back to the creating functions notebook because we're going to use the functions here to just collect everything that we've talked about so far into a few simple functions. Here we have a find data cross section function, which takes a simulation file name, finds the cross section, and returns it as well as the luminance cross section. We've got another function called visualize, which takes an experiment file name and a simulation file name, and then turns those through the use of some of the functions we've already seen into a plot of experiment x-axis on the x and luminance on the y-axis. We can then compare that directly <coughs> with the simulation. Here we created another function called calculate average luminance, which will find the average luminance over the LEDs in the region of x greater than minus 10 but less than 10. So we can combine all of these functions together into one like this, where we have glob and we acquire all of the file names, sort them into alphabetical order, and then iterate over them, saying, okay, we're going to visualize the experimental data, we're then going to find the data cross-section for the simulation data, then we're going to find the simulation average from that, and then we can extract experimental data, perform the plot, and find a percentage difference as well. The conclusion that we need to come to is that our code <coughs> simulation one is closest to the experiment. <coughs>